genocide is seen as the crime of crimes. And to all extent and purposes is, is virtually impossible to prove. And, you know, as I argue in this book, that was the point of the Genocide Convention, so that countries could engage in this, as what Martin Shaw, the sociologist, calls a degenerate form of warfare. This is not to forgive, but to understand. A podcast series discussing genocide studies with experts and those connected to its critical questions. I am Luis Gonzalez Aponte, co-host with Saba Karim. Doug Moses is the Anne and Bernard Spitzer Professor of Political Science at City University of New York. Before that, he was the Frank Porter Graham Distinguished Professor of Global Human Rights History at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He also taught at the University of Sydney and the European University Institute in Florence, uh, Italy. He is the author of The Problems of Genocide, Permanent Security and the Language of Transgression, and co-editor of many volumes on genocide, including most recently The Holocaust Museum and Human Rights, Patriotic History and the Renationalization of Memory, and Genocide Key Themes. He's senior editor of the Journal of Genocide Re Research, one of the oldest academic journals in the field. Good afternoon, Dirk. Um, we're very happy to speak today. Oh, happy to share that and delighted to be here with you, Sapa, uh, on your wonderful podcast. Dirk, I have a question, I think, for the for the larger public. I, I know people who want answers to this question. I think this question, uh, or rather the, the answers to this qu these questions may be obvious to some of us, those of us who, for instance, have been students of international law, who've been studying genocide studies and, uh, and, and prevention. My question to you is, could you, in, in a few words, explain why the existence of this schism between the legal definition of genocide versus the political definition of genocide. And when I say this, I also want to point at how I have seen people around me, again, those who are not familiar with these subject areas, be very excited at the thought that South Africa was you know, going to bring this matter at the ICJ and then watch the disappointment in their eyes when they found out that this, did, this would not have any real, tangible, practical impact in that territory that is basically the territory of uh, Palestine and, and Israel? There are a number of issues there, uh, Sabah. One is the unrealistic expectations, or if you like, idealism, that people have about international law and the way geopolitics works. You know, I mean, international law is, you know, it doesn't have an enforcement capacity like within a state. So it's a, you know, states voluntarily accede to these things. Uh, and they won't if if, it, if they think it's inimical to their sovereign interests. You know. That's one issue. Uh, the other issue are these contending definitions of genocide. Uh, in a way, we can go back to the the foundation of the concept in 1943-1944 with Raphael Lemkin, the Polish Jewish lawyer, who coined it in a in a book called Access, Rule and Occupied Europe: The Axis Powers Being the Nazi Allied Powers. Uh, and in, in this book, in chapter nine, which was about occupation strategies, hence the, turtle, the, the, the title of that occupied you know, Europe, as he's referencing the Hague Conventions, which governed conduct of states in administering occupied territory after conquest, uh, that you know, he had a very broad definition of genocide there, uh, which included persecution. He talked about permanently crippling of societies. This was also a genocide. And he was thinking of ethnic, racial, and religious groups. Because he, his model was what we now call the Holocaust, but also the, the, the German conduct in relation to the Polish Christian population, which was to be denationalized. And like many other Slavs under uh, German occupation, to be relegated to sort of a, a slave-like helot class uh, for the benefit of German uh, colonists who would take their place after tens of millions of them were starved to death in a, in a long-term plan to thin out the population. Now, happily, many, much of that didn't come to pass, but Lemkin was arguing that these denationalization policies, which were you know, violent, but included things like the banning of, say, local languages uh, uh, and demoralizing the local population and so forth, these were all tantamount to genocide because 
genocide attacked group identity. Uh, and in those days, people talked about national spirits, like the spirit of, of the Polish nation, you know, that kind of thing, which we don't, we don't use that language anymore, but we would talk about national culture. Certainly, you know, in the first half of the 20th century and in many parts of the world since and until the present day, you know, an emphatic sense of national identity was a call for people's personal identity, especially for smaller nations that experienced persecution over the centuries and, and were stateless until quite recently. I mean, don't forget much of East Central Europe uh, had a very precarious sense of state uh, status because they'd been members of the Russian Austro-Hungarian or German empires until the end of the First World War. For example, Poland was stateless or didn't have a state from its partition, series of partitions in the late 18th century until the First World War again. It got its state back. Uh, Czechoslovakia was cut out of a whole cloth and so forth, right? Ukraine was became a state as a Soviet Socialist Republic. And for the Proponents of those national projects, also the Lithuania, the Baltic states like Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia, uh, you know, gaining and keeping this state was elemental because that's how you protected this delicate national identity from its rapacious neighbors as they saw it, the Russians, the Germans, above all, with their sandwich in between, the bloodlands, as, as Timothy Snyder calls it. So the, the genocide concept was very appealing for them because it protected or get safeguarded national identity. And they defined that very broadly to include these national spirit-like entities, right? Now, when the genocide convention came to be negotiated in 1947 and 1948, cultural genocide, as this language of national spirits was expressed in the first secretariat's draft, uh, was eventually excluded in these various committees. Now, we could raise South Asia, uh, the de delegates from Pakistan and India is a great example of how these things played out. Pakistan was very adamant that cultural genocide should remain in the genocide convention because of the large Muslim minority in India that remained after partition, like two or 300 million people, right? Um, that makes India you know, one of the largest Muslim countries in the world, although Muslims are a minority. India, by contrast, was adamantly against cultural genocide as a concept, because the last thing it wanted to do was to give a weapon to Pakistan to be able to haul India before some international tribunal for the repression of Muslims within its borders. Okay. So these are the kind of geopolitics that were, were playing out in, the in 1947 and 48. And eventually, the, the, there was a majority in these committees to exclude cultural genocide and to make Holocaust resemble what they thought the Holocaust was, to make genocide resemble, which was mass murder, biological genocide, physical genocide, okay? So that's what genocide is in international law now, okay? It's about the physical survival of people who are targeted because of their group membership. Okay, now, the general public has a much has in a sense Lemkin's broader sense of genocide. Yeah. When people, you know, because genocide really means the destruction of a nation or a people or an ethnicity, right? And you can destroy a nation in many different ways. In a slow people talk about slow motion genocide. For indigenous people where culture is so central, you know, the destruction of their symbols, their sacred sites, and so forth, is experienced as an attack on their groupness, their nationality. Okay. And they will argue very plausibly, I think, that genocide should have this broader conception. But that's not what it is in the law. The law makes it extremely difficult to prosecute because the as such, at the end of that phrase, the intent to destroy and hold or apart ethnic, racial, or religious group as such. And that goes back to our dist distinction between military and genocidal intentions. The as such means that people are attacked physically for their group membership alone, for who they are, not for anything they've done, not because they may have contributed to an insurgency. And that's what the Israelis are arguing. They're saying, we're attacking Hamas 
because they're a security threat. Civilians are getting in the way, unfortunately, because of the nature of the strip, it's densely populated, and Hamas has insinuated itself in the population. So, and as long as Hamas keeps fighting, which they do, we will keep responding. And that means that along this logic, which people are now increasingly rejecting, but is legal, Israel can continue to kill quite a lot of Palestinian civilians and argue that it's legal. Now, whether it is or not will depend on particular instances when we're talking about war crimes. Okay. But what they're arguing is that these civilian casualties fall under the remit of international humanitarian law, sometimes known as the, sometimes known as the laws and customs of war, and not the Genocide Convention. You know, that their intention is to defeat, not to destroy, not to destroy the Palestinian people as such. And, you know, the lawyers say, well, yep, that's done and dusted. You know, my argument is a step further is that why do we even have such a restrictive definition of genocide? Well, if you look at the negotiations of, you know, around the Genocide Convention in the late 40s, you'll see that it was the interest of states to limit it like that precisely so they could wage war against internal and external enemies in this degenerate way, if you like, and not be prosecuted for genocide. That's right. So they had their vested interests in making sure that the definition of genocide remained as narrow as possible so they could get away with their crime. Um, and I think, therefore, that I think one of the important points to, 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 to highlight here is that uh, one can't take Article 2, subsection B of uh, the Genocide Convention, which defines, you know, genocide to be to be to be read without the assistance of assistance of experts in the field who would then fill the gaps into all the little subsections that have not been mentioned or the extra text extra definitions that have not been mentioned in the definition that we read online or that we read in the instrument itself in the legal instrument so there is much to the definition of genocide that is not spelled out clearly within the provision you recently organized a forum titled Israel-Palestine, Atrocity Crimes and the Crisis of Holocaust and Genocide Studies uh, that dealt or still deals because you're still, you're, you're, you're still, I think, waiting for a few more papers to come in. But these, uh, this forum deals with, of course, the conflicts between Israel and Palestine. And one of the papers that caught my attention was Ugu Umit uh, Unger's discussion on uh, screaming silence and mass violence in Israel-Palestine, where he raised a cogent question. Why is the war in Israel-Palestine attracting so much attention than the more destructive violence in neighboring Syria or what happened in Darfur, China, Armenia, etc.? Is Israel being held to higher standards is a question he poses. This paper especially struck a chord with me, Dirk, because um, while I was in Malaysia for 15 years, I kept hearing about the atrocities in Palestine and where because many students uh, from Palestine, you know, are in Malaysia, they usually go there um, and uh, I, I cross paths with them. They, many of them were writers, so they were writing about, you know, their emotional experiences with that. And so what, uh, of course, marked me was uh, the, the destruction and de devastation that they were undergoing, but that was not actually discussed in mainstream media or anywhere else. And yet on October 7th, what's intriguing is the, uh, the extent of coverage that that event attracted. Not that there is anything against that at all. It's just that it's interesting how uh, the, the, the media channels decide to focus on some genocides more than others. Do you have any thoughts about that? Yes, uh, I do. Uh, I mean, I commissioned all these papers by, for example, Uwe's, uh paper, uh, you know, is, is written by someone who's an expert on Syria, who's published quite a lot on the Syrian civil war, which isn't usually classified as, as genocide, but which we did cover in a smaller forum in the journal several years ago. Uh, he edited it as a guest editor. And all the five or six contributors were exile young Syrian scholars, uh, which was something that was very important for us. Uh, so in the Journal of Genocide Research, we cover more than conventional or widely recognized genocides. We're interested in the issue of mass violence against civilians. 
more generally, war crimes, crimes against humanity. Uh, you can see the broader remit on, on the homepage of the journal. Now, you know, why do certain conflicts in which there's mass violence against civilians garner more media interest than others? Well, we have to look at local context. Uh, I can't speak for Malaysia, although, you know, I've spent, you know, I come broadly from the region in Australia. Uh, and where there's a lot of Malaysian students actually in Australia, we have, you know, so these are people I've had contact with in my classes at the University of Sydney, where I taught for nearly 20 years. Uh, the context there will be different from here. Uh, so I'm guessing that the 7th of October will be differently reported uh, in Malaysia than, than it will here. I mean, in Germany, it's, it's, it's been in the mainstream media represented as a, a breach of civilization, which is a term Germans use for the Holocaust. So it's seen as in a continuum of violence, uh, like a mini Holocaust, Shoah 2.0, uh, is the kind of slogan you've seen here, which you know indicates the, the shock that, that many people, mainly Jewish people, but not only uh, experience, and are still experiencing, because you can see that there's an ongoing discussion about that. In fact, what led to the forum that you you are you know started out with in your question was an observation that uh, a number of us made among the editors. There are uh, five of us, and I'm the, the senior editor. Is that very soon after the seventh of October, uh, many centres for Holocaust and genocide studies issued you know condemnations of Hamas as committing genocidal violence, genocidal massacres. Uh, but they've said nothing about uh, the counter violence by Israel since, which has uh, accounted for 20 or 30 times the number of civilian victims. Uh, we don't know yet. I mean, among those statistics from the Gaza Health Ministry are also Hamas victims or fighters, you know, casualties. It's, uh, it's hard to, but, but we're looking at tens of thousands. Okay. So vastly more. And there are, the compounding this asymmetry was also statements and letters, you know, group letters uh, and petitions that were going around uh, in which, you know, colleagues of mine were involved in drafting or signing in which this kind of asymmetry was repeated. Uh, and, and most recently you have the former president of France, uh, Hollande, uh, saying on French TV that the French Jewish victims, Israeli victims, you know, dual citizenship uh, of the 7th of October should be honoured by an official commemoration in France. But French Palestinian victims in Gaza shouldn't be because one is victims of terror and the other are just collateral victims of warfare. Now, we were intrigued by this distinction, which really lies at the basis of Holocaust and genocide studies. And that, that assumption or distinction is this. Armed conflict is a separate logic than genocidal conflict. Genocide aims to destroy, according to this distinction, whereas armed conflict or military action, military necessity, aims to defeat. Uh, in, that, in the course of uh, military action, uh, civilian casualties are inevitable. And in fact, it's rightly argued in certain circumstances, so-called collateral or incidental civilian casualties are permitted by international humanitarian law. Now, usually in, you know, genocides do take place in the context of, a, of armed conflict, with, you know, whether it's a civil war or an international war. And usually the number of victims of genocide outstrips the, if you like, collateral victims of warfare. So that's why, there's one reason why there's this focus on genocide, because the casualties are so high. What we've got in the current situation in Gaza is the, is the inverse, where the, where the, co, you know, the, the so-called collateral damage, it is alleged, I'm not buying into that distinction, but that's the, the label, vastly exceeds the genocidal violence that precipitated it by Hamas. So we asked ourselves, what purpose does a field like Holocaust and genocide study, there's actually two fields, but they're overlapping, uh, have when 
one modality of mass death is privileged over the other. And the other is actually far more lethal. That is the number of Palestinians being killed. So in this forum where we're not asking colleagues to adjudicate, is this a genocide or not? Although some of them do that at some point in their essays. The central question is about, is there a crisis in the discipline or fields? Is there an epistemological issue? What is our object of analysis or inquiry? Is it civilian deaths or is it only genocidally motivated civilian deaths in, in a very narrow or defined way? Which would mean you would end up with the situation or, or of what Francois Hollande says in France, where he says, we're only going to commemorate one side here. Now, that, that will lead, uh, if taken to its logical conclusion, to endless civil strife, because in societies like France, Germany, which is far worse than France in this respect, and in the US and Australia, where I come from, you have communities from the region on both sides. That's right. And, and so the Palestine-Israel situation, I don't like calling it a conflict, but situation is being territorialized into many societies around the world. And therefore that memory conflict is also being in, you know, exported or imported. So I... it becomes an issue of, of you know, the civil peace in, in the US here can lead to the kind of murders that you started out with uh, or attempted murder in, in, in Austin recently where a young man wearing kafir was stabbed presumably solely because he was identified as Palestinian. Absolutely. And I think um, one of the papers in the forum just made this very powerful statement that if we are here and wondering whether, of course, as you said, wondering whether it's a genocide or not was not the main focus of the forum. But when the question was raised, I think one of the, uh, one of the, one of the scholars mentioned, if we're al already asking the question, it means that things are already very bad, right? So yeah. I, I think sometimes we have to get down to very simple observations about what's going on and why we're having these discussions. Yeah, I'd like to, uh, to wrap up this little thread, if that's what we're doing. Uh, when you talked about the diversity of views, we have invited to participate in the forum where there will be about 18 papers in total, and we now have nine, and we're publishing them as they, as they uh, come in. Um, proponents of all these positions uh, on both sides of that debate. So in order to get, you know, a, a proper a proper discussion rather than one, you know, just one side of the discussion. Right, that's a great that's a great idea. I mean, this is a, a very effective way of you know gathering the diversity of views and reflecting them right as well, showcasing the diversity of views we have out there, and as scholars respecting that, respecting the diversity of views, which is very important. One thing, sorry, sorry to keep interrupting. But one thing about getting it into an academic journal with papers of three and a half to four and a half thousand words, so they're half the length or a third of the length of a regular article. However, they you know, are going to be footnoted. And we do, as editors, ask some questions or for revisions if something's not working. Or we, you know, we, we think that they're not giving uh, an accurate depiction of an, of an argument or, or so forth. Right? And so all the papers have been adjusted by the authors in, in light of our feedback. I mean, there's not really external peer review, but we handle it within the editorial board. And, uh, the, the difference between, and this is what I'm getting, Saba, the difference is uh, between people mouthing off on social media and Facebook, where some of the participants are mouthing off. Well, you know, let's put it this way, they're speaking to their bubble, okay, because I've seen it, right? But, you know, when, and it's often unfiltered, people are very emotionally invested, as we pointed out before, right? Uh, but when people put their analytical hat on and rather than their affective one, right? And are speaking to the community of scholars rather than their own team, whatever that is. We, we, are, we are finding that the quality of work is improved because it's, it's also forever, you know, when it's in an academic journal rather than, you know, some Facebook or Instagram post, it's forever.
And, you know, we give serious feedback, people take that on board, and I think are producing quite high quality work. The first piece by Martin Shaw came out on the 3rd of January, I think, and it's already had about 5,000 views, which is quite a lot for an academic journal. And uh, that's been helped by the publisher, Taylor and Francis, kindly agreeing to make the pieces free access for two months. So you don't need to, you know, subscribe to the journal. It's just free, free to air, as it were. So this this brings me to the next question, which is, um, it's great that uh, this this whole process is being sped up in the sense of we're not having to go through the peer review process because we know that's going to take a long time. You're making sure that these articles are of high quality, these are scholarly views which are important. And so, as you said, the publisher is also making sure that uh, these these articles will be available online for two months. So this, this, of course, the, the next question I have is, um, are these discussions being given the importance that they call for, which is, the rich, since the richness of these perspectives cannot be contested, do you think um, now uh, that there is a substantial gap between theory and practice? And by that, I mean, is there a real schism between what we are discussing at the scholarly level and what is being implemented from those ideas at the practical level to tackle the war or you know, the conflicts between Israel and Palestine. In other words, are we scholars speaking from our ivory towers? Well, you know, universities are institutionalized sites of innovation. So the discussions there will always be ahead of civil society and certainly politics, uh, which has, you know, sort of settings and, and uh, uh, electoral groups, you know, populations that uh, need to be uh, uh, appeased and so forth, as well as in this country, uh, you know, masses of money that's floating around and invested in certain things. So, you know, whether it's the arms industry or what have you, right? So, you know, the ivory tower, such as it is, will always be in a different space. That said, uh, the, that role is extremely important. Now, you mentioned the this little article I wrote in, the, in the, an Australian newspaper on the two-state solution. That was part of a little forum that the newspaper organised last year, and then it was published uh, you know, a week or two ago in late January on whether the two-state solution or you know what's the point of it or what is it. And that, of course, is on the agenda because... One of the responses of the Europeans, the Americans, and now especially the Saudis, in their firm response to the Americans that they're not going to normalize relations with Israel until there's recognition of a Palestinian state, is that the two-state solution is back on the agenda uh, after it had been effectively buried over the last 15 years. And there are various reasons for that, which we don't have time to go into. So the newspaper asked uh, four people to write, you know, 800,000 word little pieces. I mean, they're little by academic standards, the normal opinion piece in a newspaper about it. And they didn't, even, they didn't give us any guidelines. You know, we could write what we want. I mean, of course, they messed with the pros and so forth as, as to make it more journalistic and less academic. But there was certainly no censorship or anything like that. And... The, you know, the consensus that has come out of the articles, at least three of the four, is that this is an illusory hope. Uh, there may have been a possibility of a two-state solution in the 1990s during the Oslo period, but the number of settlements and so forth that are, and, and settlers that have uh, colonized the, the West Bank and uh, disaggregated Palestinian territory uh, are so great that the idea of a contiguous Palestinian territory, which could be sovereign, a, a question that the Israelis have, have said is impossible. You know, it must be demilitarized, if anything, uh, has rendered it illusory. And yet, diplomats like to talk about it. And so it's a role of academics here to remind people that, you know, this, this has not worked, uh, and this has not, not worked in, to, in great measure because it's been Israeli policy over the last uh, 20 years to ensure that it doesn't work. I mean, that's why uh, under Netanyahu, Israel pol Israeli policy was to uh, quietly support 
Hamas in uh, Gaza in order to weaken the PA and to keep them separate so there couldn't be a unified national movement, uh, which could be the vehicle for a, you know, a future of Palestinian government. So, you know, the, the, the academic's role here can be one of, uh, of critic uh, and reality checking. Now, you know, how and why or how and when that can filter or percolate into policy is another question. You know, political scientists do write about that, you know, but a lot of it's got to do with who's talking to the decision makers in, in, in the White House, because the Americans are the key here. From my reading, it's clear that very few people have access to the inner sanctum. So it's a handful of people, maybe 20 or 30, who are actually creating policy or driving policy here at the White House. And even the State Department is largely frozen up. So if the State Department is largely frozen up, what, what chance do academics have? So uh, not much, okay. Not in any direct sense, but you know, changing policy settings is like changing the direction of an oil tanker or a cruise line. You know, it takes a long time to you know, move at a couple of degrees one way or the other. So the only thing we can do is, is to keep um, pointing out the obvious in academic journals, but also translating that into blogs, the, the, the literary and public affairs magazines, of which there are many in the US, um, because that does percolate eventually and contributes to a new common sense. That's true. That's true. So. So we should be hoping for, um, even as academics now, in various applications that we send out, we're actually encouraged to be able to write articles, not just for students and other faculty members, but also for the public at large. You know, So, so again, uh, since we're on the question of the public at large, my, my next question, which goes back to you know, the attacks that happened and, and, and what I started discussing when we started this podcast is, what could the civil society do to be less, uh, you know, uh, engaged as mere bystanders or fence sitters who are reading the news and who are absorbing all that's going on while feeling helpless and miserable because they can't do anything about what's going on right now? We are seeing a tremendous civil society mobilization for a ceasefire uh, across the world. Uh, you know, tens of thousands of people are on the streets in Germany, here, even Australia, uh, the UK. Uh, I'm seeing on social media even greater numbers in, in global South countries to generalize in this way. Uh, now, there's also, of course, the vast majority of the population in the West that's probably confused and sits it out. You know, perhaps they're fence sitters. But the, you know, a lot of people just don't know really what's going on and, and um, only see images on the news. And uh, when I do occasionally watch the US news, I'm ins consistently shocked by the partiality of it. Um, so that, and that runs counter to the protest movement. You know, it's very much in favor of US policy, if you want to put it that way. Uh, and the same goes for the UK in, in, the, in, in Germany, which is where I follow the media uh, more closely, and Australia. At the same time, you know, quite prominent members of the mainstream media have also found it impossible to ignore the, the civilian casualties and suffering in Gaza and are asking harder questions. And this is where we can see the dynamism of situations. The ICJ, the International Court of Justice decision, which we're probably going to get to, has licensed journalists to ask Israeli politicians, military representatives, and so forth, who appear on television when they're interviewed, harder questions, because they can quote the transcript, which the South Africans have read into the record. Transcripts of senior Israeli politicians and military leaders making outlandish, you know, genocidal statements about collective guilt, wiping out people, and so forth, nuking people. And uh, I haven't seen that before. So here you have a complex dynamic where you know, global indignation led to South Africa initiating this case, you know, not an Arab country, not even a Muslim majority country, but South Africa initiating this case, uh, forcing Israel to respond 
uh, at the ICJ. And then this plays out on live television uh, for a global public. So what you could observe, I think, is that while these mass demonstrations do not for a minute make for, say, the American administration or the German government change its mind on it, right? uh, really, they really just ignore it. Uh, only if there are electoral implications uh, will they take notice, but even then they won't change their policy. Right? Uh, but what you're seeing is how this global mobilization has led, because you always need states to take the initiative in the end in, a, in, a, in this global system, has led one particular state to tug on the lever known as the International Court of Justice. And that then has a knock-on effect on the international conversation uh, in the press. And states now are having to respond. So for example, Japan has decided it's not going to cooperate anymore with an Israeli arms dealer or te technolo uh, military technology firm uh, because the ICJ has said parties to the genocide convention have an obligation to prevent genocide. And there's a high probability that genocide could be taking place in Gaza. And so if you take your prevention duty seriously, you will think twice about sending weapons to the Israelis. Now, I don't think the Americans, British and Germans are thinking twice about it, but wait till lawsuits start, because these are in the end, uh, rule bound societies, you know, with some rough edges, where people can say they're you a member of the party of an international treaty, and you're not ab ab abiding by your uh, legal obligation here. And so this will then be played out in the courts. So there are different ways of putting pressure on a state. You know, one is popular mobilization, the other is legal, but they, you know, gradually, you know, as I said, Lord, change the direction of the ship. But it's going to take a long time, if ever. I think it is rather admirable that there has been a shift in the stance by the Global South countries to take action in these cases of genocide, for instance. And what South Africa's South Africa has done, joined in by Mexico, Chile, Nicaragua, as we know, is not unprecedented. We also have the example of the Gambia, uh, another African country that um, brought, the, brought Myanmar to the ICJ very recently and uh, it and and thereafter was joined by five other european countries including canada um in that in that action at the icj so what we feel is that i remember in 2006 when i was you know doing uh, my masters in international law in malaysia i remember the term or the notion of to the internet of international law as a toothless tiger was driven home in many ways. So today, if we look at what's happened in the sense that global South countries are feeling empowered enough through the international law mechanism to take action against not just, let's just say in the case of genocide, but also South Africa brought the United States in the, put the United States in the dock. I think that's really a shift of power from you know America, from, from the West, from European nations onto, well, the rest of the world pretty much. Do you have any observations about, I mean, I know that you just talked about how we will hope that, you know, the legal effects and uh, or the legal judgments handed down by these courts would, you know, uh, stir other people, stir other bodies into action. But do you have any observations about this shift of approach in international law and where we will eventually go from here? Well, I'm guessing that in Malaysia and your legal training, you were exposed to a fair bit of you know, what's called twail, third world approaches to international law, uh, to which I'm quite sympathetic. And my, my book you mentioned on the problems of genocide, although not driven by that literature, comes to very similar conclusions about the coloniality and state-centric and originally Western or Eurocentrism of uh, the, what was known as the law of nations or uh, now international law. Now, what you know, the law is also, however, a site of contestation, and you know, the, it can be nudged in different directions. For example, 
the the League of Nations that was established uh, after the First World War, you know, was really meant to be uh, a vehicle for the great powers uh, in Europe, plus the Americans. But it did have its own assembly, like the General Assembly of the United Nations, and set up things like the uh, Permanent Mandates Commission. And these institutions sometimes take on a life of their own and, and can't just become the plaything of the great powers that created it. And likewise with the General Assembly of the United Nations. You know, the, the General Assembly was very different in 1965 than it was in 1945, precisely because a lot of decolonization had taken place in the meantime. So there are all these African and Asian states now suddenly in uh, the UN passing resolutions on apartheid and, and uh, the right of armed resistance against colonial rule and so forth. And that eventually led to the additional protocols of the Geneva Convention in 1977, where the legitimacy of armed resistance and certainly the protected status of guerrilla fighters if they abide by certain rules was recognized. Where in the past, they were just seen as a criminal bandits and could virtually be shot you know, on site uh, or summarily. So there are you know, incremental changes as the international system, uh, you know, it's populated by new players and so forth. Uh, but, you know, many critics, have, including myself, have also observed that in the end, it's states are the only people here or, or entities with emphatic legal personality. And even post-colonial states have their own agendas, which can be inimical to human rights. And you know, many of these states weren't very stable and, and led to genocidal style uh, conflicts soon after their independence. One thinks of Nigeria seven years after its uh, independence. In 1967, you have this, uh, this Biafra civil war that, that goes until early 1970 in which three million or so people died, mainly through starvation. But, that was driven by a blockade of uh, the, the Biafra, so-called Biafra region, mainly the Igbo population, in which people starved to death. And you know, some people are making comparisons now between that and the effective blockade of Gaza by Israel. One of the essays in the in the uh, forum by Melanie Tanini and at the University of Michigan focuses on the question of famine. She's a historian of famine. And I would commend that uh, for all your listeners and viewers. So it, it's not necessarily East versus West or North versus South uh, dynamic. You, you know, states have their own agendas. And so, for example, when the Genocide Convention was negotiated in 1947, 1948, and then signed off at the very end of 1948, through, you know, filtering through multiple committees as a draft convention was whittled down to its bare essentials and cultural genocide was locked off and, and uh, political groups were not considered a protected category and so forth. It became clear that there was an unholy alliance between the Soviet Union, which wanted to be able to persecute anti-communists, perceived anti-communists, counter-revolutionary forces, and or with right-wing Latin American regimes, which wanted to prosecute communists. Right? But they all agreed that we want to be able to deal with internal security issues and insurgencies, whether communist or any communist, without being accused of genocide. So we're, going to ex we're not going to include political groups, political identity as a protected category in the Genocide Convention. So you know, this wasn't a case of Western powers driving this. This is a very different set of coalitions within, you know, within the United Nations at the time. And historians have written about this. And so, you know, we look upon the Genocide Convention as a very, you know, as an historical artifact, a product of its time, rather than sort of the eternal truth about uh, what group destruction is or should be. Um, and so. If you look at it in that dynamic sense, and you know that is as, as is contextualized in time and place, you can foresee that, and as a product of the end of the Second World War and the beginning of the Cold War, you can you can see well at some point there's going to be another global 
conjuncture where we revisit those categories that were formulated at the end of the Second World War, if you like, in the first half of the 20th century. Like crimes against humanity is really an artifact of the First World War, was used in relation to the Armenians, not legally, but rhetorically, then becomes you know, embodied in the as a, one of the major indictments in the Nuremberg trials. Right? But we might be in one of those moments of, of you know, the reconfiguration of, our, of the settings in our sort of in our imagination of international criminal law now. And one reason, one other reason that I, I initiated the forum of the journal is because we are seeing that there is a crisis of our categories, you know, because, you know, the traditional conventional distinction between armed conflict or military logic and genocidal logic has is leading to a situation where we are prioritizing or privileging the, the mass killing, uh, terrible mass killing on the 7th of October, and just relegating the infinitely greater number of mortality, uh, extended mortality, uh, which is still ongoing, as a mere product of warfare, and maybe some war crimes. Right? Uh, now, what I'm seeing, and I wrote about this just on a blog uh, from the Dawn website, uh, today, which is the um, 9th of February, I think, uh, that what we're seeing, I think, in the global outrage, certainly outside Europe and America, but also within those societies, from those protest movements, is a rejection of that distinction between um, legitimate armed conflict, illegitimate genocidal intention. People are recognizing that there is a mode of armed conflict with genocidal outcomes or genocidal aspects. And that because they only have this limited repertoire in our vocabulary to work with, they call it genocide and try to squeeze it into the, to the stipulations of the genocide convention, you know, which is always a matter of kind of, it's a procrustean bread, like stuffing a messy reality into these neat categories of international law. And it, you know, can often distort uh, distort the complexity of this reality. But what's not complex is the fact that tens of thousands of civilians, uh, most of them women and children, who are in no way combatants, are being pretty deliberately killed. Even if the uh, Israeli authorities will say that's not the aim of their campaign, the aim of their campaign is to vanquish Hamas. And that Hamas is using them as human shields because it's embedded itself in this population or underneath it in tunnels. And so they have no choice. Now, that reasoning is, is, is not increasingly not being accepted as legitimate uh, for various reasons we, we could get into if you want. But people don't accept this as a legitimate mode of warfare anymore. And I think that is heralding a tectonic shift in our sensibilities, which to some extent is generational, I think to the credit of Gen Z, so the, the age of our undergraduate students, they just don't think this is acceptable anymore. Whereas, it, you know, this was the norm during the Second World War beforehand, and quite a lot of many decades since then. Like, there was a debate about genocide in Vietnam, which was driven by the left, people like Jean-Paul Sartre, wrote an essay about genocide in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Now, if you read it, he makes some, I think, implausible connections between, uh, you know, US conduct in Vietnam and the Holocaust. There's always this attempt to analogize, which fails usually, that is the Holocaust doesn't look like Vietnam or vice versa, right? But it's undeniable that the Americans killed tens, hundreds of thousands of Indo-Chinese, whether in Vietnam or in Cambodia, with bombing campaigns and other forms of uh, uh, military conduct like chemical warfare with Agent Orange and so forth. And that this was, you know, that and that these casualties were totally foreseeable. Okay. The Russians wage warfare that way uh, in Chechnya and now in Ukraine with total disregard to the civilian population. Although they say, as all states do, that they abide by the laws of war, but they don't. Okay. And it, not for nothing have you know, Ukrainians and their supporters been calling the Russian campaign genocidal. 
Now, the international lawyers are, you know, because they're sticklers for the black letter law, and that, that's what they do, they have no choice, have been, you know, less enthusiastic about that. And the ICC has indicted Putin and one of his officials for war crimes in the transfer of the children. Could have easily made it genocide, because that's also one of the articles in the Genocide Convention, I think, 2E. But, you know, they're very conservative, the international lawyers, and, you know, genocide is seen as the crime of crimes. And to all extent and purposes, is is virtually impossible to prove. And, you know, as I argue in this book, that was the point of the Genocide Convention, so that countries could engage in this, as what Martin Shaw, the sociologist, calls a degenerate form of warfare, with it, where it's, you know, really killing a lot of civilians because it's so indiscriminate in its, in its targeting. Uh, where, you know, and people are saying, no, that is not acceptable anymore. We may have accepted it in the Second World War with, you know, flattening German cities, uh, atomic bombs onto Japanese cities, uh, blockades and so forth, but this is just unacceptable. And, you know, international law, it will take decades for these conventions to be amended, if ever, you know, is, is going to follow that at some point, I think. And I think we're at the beginning of that process now, so there is a change of uh, morality in that sense, uh, in terms of how we, we, we see all this. That's, that's an interesting observation. And I think we have to be mindful of how that plays out in our lives and how, I think, as Nietzsche points out, we should never take man to be constant all the time in the way he views society and in his morals, uh, you know, about any subject for that matter. So just to reel back, to rewind to what you spoke about earlier when we started this um, session today, you spoke about the term breach of civilization, which is the term used in German um, for what happened uh, on October 7th. And you said that uh, this, of course, refers to what happened uh, during the Holocaust. Uh, itself. And so I have a question regarding all of these comparisons that we are making in the media. For instance, um, you know, uh, since we have the natural tendency to look for patterns, in the current war, uh, October 7th has been likened to the Holocaust on one hand, and then um, soon after that, 150 Holocaust scholars signed a statement, statement sorry, released in November condemning Hamas's atrocities, which they said, I quote, unavoidably bring to mind the mindset and the methods of the perpetrators of the pogroms that paved the way to the final solution, unquote. On the other hand, on the Palestinian side, the current conflicts have been likened to the Nagba in 1948. Now, how fair is this habit of, you know, likening all of these major events to, you know, previous uh, um, happenings? Yeah, that's a terrific question. I mean, my current book project, which is called Genocide and the Terror of History, is very much about this inclination of people, especially those that are you know, living under the sign of trauma, if you like, to analogize uh, with the most catastrophic periods in their history, their people's history. And this, this pertains particularly people who, who, you know, whose group identity, national or ethnic identity, is a core sense of their personal identity. You know, a lot of people don't care about their national identity, but a lot of people do. <laughs> and those that do, and they're members of nations or peoples that have experienced genocide in the not so recent past, you know, will tend to make these temporal slippages or engage in these temporal slippages or links. It's not surprising. I think it's, you know, part of the human condition. Now that doesn't mean that they can't be contested. You know, some, some analogies will be more compelling or plausible than others. Uh, with regard to the first one, I've seen quite a lot of that as myself. And, you know, I, I recall uh, the criticism of it by uh, the Israeli historian at Brown University, Omer Batov, himself, you know, who, who writes on the Holocaust, who says that this isn't really related to the tradition of pogroms. Uh, the tradition of pogroms uh, in East Central Europe was one where Jews were a hapless minority and certainly stateless and were being terrorized by the majority. Whereas what we have on the 7th of October, terrible as it is, was a case of a, uh, an, 
an ethnically cleansed and colonized people, or at least it's the militias, you know, representing it, uh, striking back at the civilians of a powerful state. Uh, and so the, the, the motivations and contexts are completely different. You know, like Jews aren't vulnerable and stateless as they were in the first half of the 20th century. They now are mem living in Israel. Uh, Israelis have a very powerful military, and in fact, it's nuclear power, right? And can, you know, destroy most of the infrastructure in Gaza in very short period of time. That's something that Hamas can't do. It has rockets, they've improved in capacity over the decades, but you know, they're pinpricks by by deficit by comparison, right? As you know, much as they terrorize local populations in Israel, not trivializing that. But the asymmetry is is impossible to ignore. And I think so I think Omer Batov makes a, a valuable point there. And this can't really be narrated you know, into a Holocaust or certainly a uh, pogrom-like context. There's a lot of talk that Hamas are like the Nazis and they want to destroy Jews everywhere. You know, here and there in their charter, there's some nasty language about Jews. But in fact, they want to expel non-Indigenous Jews from Israel. They're not, this isn't a global project like the Nazis were. They're not uh, inimical. They don't find Jews as such inimical. They're interested, uh, that is, in getting rid of settler Jews in historic Palestine. People forget also that the uh, the forces that breached the the wall, the fence in the seventh of October, killed Thai agricultural workers without mercy who were working in the kibbutzes, and even Arab Israelis, as they're known, but Palestinian citizens of Israel and Bedouin and Druze you know, who spoke Arabic with them. I've seen some transcripts to that to that uh, effect. But they were seen to be collaborators with the Israelis and therefore guilty, you know, according to this terrible anti-settler logic, and were were murdered accordingly. So it wasn't ethnically motivated alone. Okay, so in that sense, it can't be narrated into a Holocaust narrative, a Holocaust script. I understand the temptation and has great sort of advocacy value, propaganda value, right? Because if you can cast an enemy as the Nazis. And then there can be no limits to how you confront. Now, on the other side of the equation, the continuation with the Nakba narrative seems to hold much more water because we're dealing with the same population and uh, we're dealing now with a, you know, aspirations on the part of at least some members of the Israeli state to deport or ethnically cleanse this population they're using the language of encouraging migration, right? uh, but it's effectively a, a, a population transfer. And this, so this is very much in keeping with what happened in 1948. Uh, and this has been an ongoing process in fits and starts uh, since then. Uh, and we mustn't forget the West Bank where the French government called, uh, says a policy of terror is being instituted by settlers in collaboration with the state, where you know they've killed you know over three hundred people since the seventh of October, and are, you know trying to induce villagers and shepherds and so forth to leave. And Jordan is not going to take them, but that's the aspiration to get as many Palestinians out of the West Bank as possible. This this crisis moment is seen as a once in a generation opportunity to continue the work, the unfinished business of 1948. So the, the, the Nakba analogy is, 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 is all too present for people, and people shouldn't forget, Israeli politicians themselves are saying that let's do another Nakba, words to that effect. So this is something this isn't something that's been read into the documents or you know seen, it's not between the lines. This is an explicit discourse. And, and I think um, I, of all the talks that I have listened to, of all the papers that I've read on the subject, I think um, it's very clear that people are missing out on that added dimension that you just referred to, which is basically 
um, the, the, the other element we're not factoring in, for instance, uh, which is basically the Middle Eastern conflicts themselves, the tensions within that area, within that territory. So, for instance, there are statements that Israel only has one state, whereas Arab states, Arab, the Arab world is made up of many states. Why can't Palestinians accept the fact that, you know, uh, there are Israelis in the, in the neighborhood? So... Uh, there, there are all of these debates that have come up over time, and I like the fact that we have touched on this and that we have to keep in mind that this is not just about the Holocaust or about these greater you know, dynamics that we speak about worldwide, but it's also about the local conflicts within that land, within the other ethnicities that exist within that territory. Um, I have one last question, and this is regarding an article that you exchanged with me, that you sent me, because we've been having conversations before this podcast. Um, I am curious about what you feel about the article um, by that was published by the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Uh, if you remember the titles Governing Gaza After the War, the Israeli Perspectives, and it's written by Ari Dubno Dubnov, among other people. People. And um, the summary of this article is that it sort of like presents possible predictions about uh, the future, as in what will happen after these conflicts basically abate. What are your views on that? I mean, I'm just extremely pessimistic because the, as many commentators have pointed out, it's not in the interest of Netanyahu and uh, the head of the army who have egg on their face because of the mistakes on the 7th of October, the security catastrophe for Israel, to end the war. They need the war to continue as long as possible. Otherwise, they'll end up losing their jobs inevitably. And uh, Hamas is still you know, resisting the Israeli incursion. So as long as this goes on, uh, uh, the Israeli state will, will persist in trying to crush Hamas. And the civilian population, which is, you know, being corralled to an ever smaller corner of Gaza, will, will continue to suffer. So it's hard to know, you know, when this is going to end. The Americans and Europeans are, I think, you know, will not, we know that they want them to, to wrap this up as quickly as possible. And that does present Israel with uh, a, a major strategic dilemma, because if there isn't a emphatic military victory over Hamas. You know, if you, Israel is forced to to uh, silence the gun, say in a month or two, and Hamas is still fighting, this will be seen as a major defeat for Israel, because its war aims were to do, were to uh, vanquish and neutralize Hamas in the aim of what I call permanent security to make sure Hamas could never ever be a threat again, and there would be a a new type of administration there. In fact, the Prime Minister of Israel tweeted that just today. Um, a civilian administration that doesn't preach hate, you know, this kind of language. So no more Palestinian resistance of any type. So very pro-Western, pro-Israeli administration. Now, I've seen commentators talk about this, and no one can envisage the viability of such an administration. Arab states aren't going to participate in it. Uh, the Israelis have said the PA can't be the vehicle for that. So who is it going to be? If there's going to be hand-picked local Palestinian collaborators, they will be liquidated by you know, the remnants of Hamas, Islamic Jihad, and so forth. In Gaza, it would be completely unstable. And you would inevitably have a long-term Israeli military occupation, which is not what anyone wants, and nor can Israel afford it. So it's hard to know what, what this is going to look like. Now, we, we also know that there are countervailing or disparate forces within Israel itself in the political class. You have the Kahanas, the settlers, who are looking to resettle Gaza and push out as many Palestinians as possible. They talk explicitly of thinning out the population. Right? Uh, Netanyahu is not backing that right now. Uh, he understands that. Egypt isn't going to take anyone, and neither is Canada. It's a state that's often been mentioned by some of the settler proponents. Uh, the idea is that you know all states around the world take some of the two million or so refugees, and that um, 
that can be left then for Israel. Right? I mean, this is a kind of utopia to reverse the perceived mistake of 2005 when Ariel Sharon withdrew from, uh, from Gaza. They want to reverse that mistake. Netanyahu doesn't go quite that far, but you know, he may not be the prime minister for long. If and when he goes and there's a, an election, it's most likely that you'll get a much more centrist government, uh, which is more likely to you know, listen to the Americans and the Europeans. And inevitably, they might have to try to install the Palestinian Authority there. Uh, now, as we know, the, the Western powers are talking about a two-state solution, to circle back to our earlier conversation. But the Israelis have made it clear that there's not going to be any sense of sovereign Palestinian state, certainly you know, with no military capacity. So then it's not a state. You can't have states which are demilitarized. It's by definition not a state. Uh, so it would be, from the Palestinian perspective, a continuation of apartheid, which they're not going to tolerate. You know, it would be you know, some kind of local autonomy, but without any sovereign capacities. And certainly not the ability to protect Palestinians from settler depredations, you know, which is what's going, going on in the West Bank right now. So it, it, you know, the international community is trying to come up with solutions. But once again, to also circle back to our discussion about the role of academics, we are telling you that this two-state solution is not going to work. We're telling you until the, uh, the foundational you know, violence of 1948, the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians, isn't addressed and that the occupation isn't addressed, then you're never going to have uh, peace and security for anyone in the region. And so many people are talking about confederal or binational solutions within one uh, loosely you know, or, uh, organized state uh, where everyone has equal rights. So the basic principle has got to be equal rights for everyone. Now, that's a discussion worth having. It's extremely utopian at the moment, but you've got to start somewhere. And people certainly aren't in the mood in this traumatized moment to talk about equal rights for anyone. But, you know, let, let's see where the conversation is in a year when, when these other solutions have been attempted and have failed. This was not to forgive, but to understand with our guest, Dirk Moses. To our listeners, don't forget to like, subscribe, and stay tuned for more discussions. If you would like to see and hear more from our guest, he will be speaking on the problems of genocide, definitional constraints, and the Israel-Palestine conflicts at the Genocide Awareness Symposium held in April 2024 at Texas State University.